Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining today's webinar, Ramping Up Your Post-COVID-19 Orthopedic Case Volume, presented by the American College of Perioperative Medicine. Just a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. Attendees are in listen-only mode. If you have any questions at any point during this webinar, feel free to submit your questions using the question pane, which is located within your GoToWebinar control panel. Without further ado, I will pass the mic over to Leslie to begin with speaker introductions. Thank you, Nicole. Hello, everyone. I am Leslie Basham. I am the President and Chief Operating Officer for Surgical Direction. Uh, joining me today is Jeff Peters, who is the CEO and one of the founders of Surgical Direction, and Tom Blasco, the Senior Physician Managing Director and also a founder of Surgical Direction. So I want to take a little bit of time uh, before we dive in, just 30 seconds or so. Uh, some of you may already be familiar with, with Surgical Directions, but for those of you who are not, um, I'll just spend a little bit of time to, to say who we are. So Surgical Directions is a leading healthcare solutions company that focuses on driving financial and organizational results for hospitals, ASCs, and physician groups. We typically generate around 10 times return on fees and provide consulting, leadership placement, and digital products for surgical services and OB departments. Uh, We've been in business for about 20 years or so and have helped uh, over 400 uh, different healthcare organizations to improve their organizational, operational, and financial performance. So with that, let's uh, dive into the agenda. So if we flip to the next slide here, we wanna cover three key objectives. First, how has COVID-19 affected surgical services and the financial performance of hospitals and ASCs? We'll put an orthopedic lens on that. We also want to cover what are the immediate solutions that you can do as healthcare providers, physicians, or administrators uh, to implement, uh, that you can implement today to compensate for the lost revenue that may have been incurred uh, via the postponement of elective surgeries, and then also, what should hospitals and ASCs be doing now in orthopedic surgeon, in orthopedic surgery, to plan to accelerate the recovery from the COVID-19 crisis? And as Nicole mentioned at the beginning, we will leave time to answer people's questions at the end of the discussion. So I encourage you to write your questions in, and we will address them uh, at the end of the presentation. So if we flip to the next slide, COVID-19 is having a, a serious financial impact on hospitals, ASCs, and, and physician groups. This is not a surprise to anybody listening to this webinar. Um, the, the impact though, the scale of the impact may be, there's been far greater uh, financial pressures on healthcare organizations than would have been expected. So while the ICUs may be overwhelmed with COVID patients in some regions, other departments, like orthopedic surgery or primary care have seen a sharp decrease in volume. So we've seen a 50% decrease in office visits and elective surgeries, um, including orthopedics, have declined up to 80% during this time. Simultaneously, we're being hit with additional costs, right? So no one was the COVID-19 you know, response expert before this happened, right? So there's been education and training, the development of a plan uh, staff overtime, the repurposing of, of anesthesiology to, to support uh, COVID, the repurposing of equipment, purchasing additional equipment. There has been a huge amount of cost pressure um, when partnered with that, that financial revenue pressure that's creating really a financial crisis. And, and sadly, we're seeing this across the, the news as well with, with hospitals uh, uh, filing for bankruptcy, uh, furloughs, salary reductions, a lot of very painful actions happening out of this crisis. So if we flip to the next slide. So what we're seeing is, we'll focus specifically on elective surgery, and I think that's important for this audience, and, and the impact it is having on your organization. So we're really seeing two 
key impacts. The first being this the sharp drop in cases, right? So as soon as the, um, the American College of Surgeons or CMS said, okay, COVID-19, we need to respond to this, postpone all elective surgeries, there was a very sharp drop. And that postponement period for many of us is still unknown. So we are hearing, you know, some facilities opened this week, uh, a few, uh, quite a few more will open next week, maybe the week after. But there are, there are some that still don't know that duration of that postponement period. And unlike the sharp drop that occurred uh, early March, the, the uptick will be more gradual. So there was a talk of a surge. And as we're hearing from many of our hospital partners and ASC partners, people are, are taking potentially a more gradual approach to the return to elective surgery. So there's a postponement value loss coupled with this lost revenue rot loss. So the what you were running from a surgical volume average before may temporarily be um, or, or permanently just become lost revenue where you may not recover as much of that revenue as you were before. And that's um, particularly painful because surgical surface services typically generate around 60% of high performing hospitals operating margin. So when you have this kind of hit uh, within a health system, um, within surgical services, it, it really impacts uh, the bottom line for that particular institution. So if we flip to the next slide, I wanna dig deeper into that lost revenue portion. So why are we losing revenue? And if we look at this uh, inverted triangle here, so many of these cases are expected to be rescheduled. We are expecting about 80% um, of the volume to recover. That's our projection. Uh, we will learn more over these coming weeks. But where are those 20% going? And, and many, much of that loss has to do with the financial state of patients today. So unemployment is at all-time record highs. And, and that unemployment means for most of those people, they have lost their health insurance. And so they're no longer, without their health insurance, able to get that elective surgery done. Uh, or let's say they do have their health insurance, but now they're not in a position, either they had to burn or use their uh, PTO balance uh, during this time, or they're in a position where they can't take time off once we are back to work because uh, if they, they don't have the financial luxury of taking time off to do their surgery anymore. They need to make up for the lost income that occurred during this period. So we're really gonna see financial pressures and then um, harder to, to size, but just as important is the mental or emotional anxiety that this is having on patients. And so we expect also quite a bit of patients Leslie, can you hear us okay? Well, I know. Um, I don't, we um, put two slides. I think we might have lost Leslie. So this is Jeff. Jeff Peters, unfortunately, I think we've lost Leslie. So what the um, COVID crisis has done is it's really taken certain trends we have in healthcare and accelerated them. What's happening in terms of surgery when we're interviewing um, patients and physicians is because of a fear of going to a hospital 
it's really accelerating the movement of surgery from AS, from hospitals to ASCs because of the inability to go see a physician. What we see is a growth of telemedicine. There's an extreme focus on safety protocols, a real emphasis on value-based care, and the consumer is emerging as a much more powerful role in sort of making healthcare decisions. So these trends were going on in the past. They're sort of accelerating because of the crisis. We could have the next slide. So what should physicians, surgeons, and healthcare providers do in, in light of this crisis? And I think the first thing which helps to stop the immediate pain that we'll talk about is to apply for funding. There's been a lot of money from the CARES Act that's available to hospitals, ASCs, and physicians. <clears throat> and not everybody is aware that they can apply for these funds. They're grants. They don't have to be paid back. It's fairly easy to apply for. And we'll talk about that over the next couple of slides. So it's something that everybody should do. And then, both for your practice and for the surgical environment, what do we do to plan for this big influx of orthopedic cases we see as the states begin to give permission to do elective surgery again? We've seen a 60% drop in elective surgery within hospitals. Most ASCs have really um, stopped um, doing elective surgery, and most surgeons' practices have seen a 70 to 90% drop in volume. So it's been pretty significant. If we could have the next slide. Under the CARES Act, which is this big stimulus, there's been $175 million that's made available to help compensate providers for the increased cost of dealing with COVID, and particularly for hospitals, ASCs, and surgeons to try to cushion the financial blow. And there's been about $60 billion that's been put out now um, that's available. $30 billion was released about 10 days ago, and it was just based on any providers, Medicare fee-for-service payments over the past year. If you go into the website, and what we've done is provided a link in this slide, there's also additional $20 billion that's available to any surgeon, physician, ASC, or hospital and it's based upon the amount of revenue you had in 2019. If it's a hospital, it's automatically put into the system by the Medicare cost report, and all you have to do is verify your TIN. You have to verify the number of ICU beds you had operating in um, March and the number of COVID-positive patients. For physicians and ASCs, you have to submit electronically your income tax return, but by doing that and answering two or three more questions, you automatically will get a grant in proportion to what your revenue is, total healthcare spending. And then there's a third bucket that is really prioritized for hospitals and facilities dealing with a high COVID-19 patient mix. So that is one you also have to apply for. What we're finding is, if we could have the next slide, is a lot of organizations don't know that they're eligible to apply for this, and there's money that they could get that have very few ramifications to pay back that, um, they're not applying for. And all you have to do is to document, because there will be a um, later form to fill out, 
to justify the expenses is what's the revenue that you lost because of COVID? If you were seeing 100 patients a day in your practice last year and it's dropped to 20 patients a day, that's all you have to do is keep track of that revenue loss, the money you've spent on additional medical supplies and equipment, um, if it's a hospital, building new ICUs, all of those are reimbursable. What isn't reimbursable under the CARES program are expenditures that are paid for by insurance. Um, anything that a patient can build a commercial insurance for Medicare, Medicaid, that's not, um, <clears throat> that's not reimbursable. The other warning is you need to be careful um, recently, the University of Colorado did executive bonuses based upon the performance of 2019. It came out at the same time that they were furloughing patients. And as a result of that, the government has begun to question whether they're eligible for some of this um, CARES money. So you just have to be diplomatically correct but it's money that's available. There's 175 billion that will be distributed and there's only 60 billion where they've opened up the portal um, so far. So if I can have the next slide. So because there's so much money available, you really need to pay attention to this website and in your organization have somebody check it daily because again, it's money that does not have to pay back. The website will talk about who's eligible and it's really almost any healthcare provider um, that has a provider number. There's an application process that changes with each pool of money. So you need to be able to document where you're spending the money, how you've lost revenue, and that's very important in case that there is um, a, um, a retrospective look at it. But the other thing, just like the small business loans, is there's a small pot of money. It's hard to call $175 billion a small pot of money. So it's important to act quickly because in some of the categories, whoever applies first, and their application is being complete, gets the money, and there is an expectation that some of the funds will be depleted. So it's not something that you want to ignore. And in terms of that $20 billion allocation that was released over the weekend, a large, large number of providers have already submitted their data and have they had their applications being complete. So you don't want to delay in terms of applying for that money. Next slide. So how do you organize to really recover? And what we're seeing is better performing physician groups, ASCs, and hospitals have really established a COVID-19 recovery console. It includes finance because so much of this is driven by um, changes in the financial status of our organization. It's also important to have information technology there because we need to keep track of the information. And what's critically important is having operations, your medical staff, your nursing personnel and administration. What we wanna see is a group that can collaboratively look at what's going on and then collaboratively develop an action plan. So if you go to the next slide, please. So what that action plan looks like is really getting the key stakeholders to talk about the problems and to talk about their priorities. There is a backlog of cases, but the people that are most in touch with what is the backlog and what is the urgency of the cases are the surgeons. So you need to have constant communication with the surgeon's office 
who do you have that needs surgery? What's the urgency from a medical standpoint? What do we have to do to get rid of your backlog and to meet your needs? It's that constant communication. And as Leslie said earlier, we've got almost 20% of our workforce that is no longer employed or has been furloughed. So lots of people that were planning to have surgery can't afford surgery. So we're gonna wanna connect with those patients to understand what's going on, to overcome their fears of going into a healthcare facility in light of this virus and the fears of getting it. We're also gonna have to work with those patients in terms of out of pocket. Patients have been unemployed. They're fearful of losing their job if they have a job now. So we've gotta be flexible and re-examine um, in terms of how we're going to ask for, for out of pocket um, payments. And we just have to, on the basis of all this information, optimize our services. So if we could go to the next slide, please. What we, we've really um, looked at is um, the, the six P's of um, how to prepare for post-COVID recovery. And the first one is to develop a plan. What is the plan? How many resources do we have? How are we going to organize our resources? How are we gonna form this governance council? We also need to be very aware of policy and regulation. The American Academy of Orthopedic Surgery, the CDC, the ASA, the American College of Surgeons have given me guidance as to how we manage surgery in light of this crisis. And we want to adapt our policy and how we accept patients in light of it. Um, if you look at the policies that came out just recently, most organizations are recommending that any patient have a um, COVID test 72 hours prior to surgery. And those are the types of things we need to do. We also need to create a prioritization list of how we're going to accept backlog cases. We first have to deal with cases where delay could harm the patients ability to use a limb or permanently damage a, a cancer patient where delaying it might be advanced. But what's the priority and how do we prioritize who gets blocked time after we come into operation again and how we sort of phase back up? If I could have the next one. The next thing we have to pay attention to is how we manage our patients and our processes in light of this COVID-19 epidemic. We talked about that patients need to be tested prior to day of surgery. We want to do a temperature test at day of surgery. We also want to make sure all staff members and all surgeons have a weekly COVID test to make sure that we're not exposing patients and other healthcare providers to the risk. Um, there's a whole different process that Dr. Blasto will get into for the, extubation, the intubation and extubation of patients. It's not gonna look the way it looked before and it's gonna take more time. So that what we're seeing is the turnaround time for cases that are now done is gonna be at least 50% longer than prior turnaround times have been. So that's vitally important. If I could have the next one, we also need to pay attention to the space, the place. We're gonna to have to have waiting rooms where chairs are at least six feet apart and try to restrict visitors in the waiting room. In our PACU, we need to make sure that there are six feet between patients and the patient is wearing protective equipment in addition to all of the providers throughout the center. So it just changes our standards of care 
and it makes it really much more complicated to provide care. And, and the final piece is in terms of the patient. What this environment has done is really encouraged us to be much more in communication with the patient. What's been going on with them from a health standpoint? What are their fears? What are their concerns? We not only have to test the patient prior to surgery, but we also need to communicate with the patient daily for five to seven days after they've had surgery. And in certain cases, what they're asking is that they have a COVID test three days after surgery to make sure that there's no complications. So what this crisis has done has really changed the manner in which we've organized care and surgical care was complicated before it. It's reached an incredible level of complication now. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Blasco, who's going to try to explain how we deal with these complications. Tom? Uh, thank you, Jeff. Um, the, what, what I'm gonna be talking about is a lot of, of, of actualizing kind of the, uh, the uh, joint statement from the American College of Surgeons, the AHA, the ASA, and, the, and ARN. Um, surgical directions have had a lot of experience over the years with basically taking recommendations and guidelines and actually implementing them. So I'm gonna be talking about this in a number of ways. How do you get from a guideline or a statement to an actually uh, a, a safe, implemented process that basically protects your patients and your caregivers uh, during this uh, COVID uh, crisis. So let's start with uh, getting the patient to the operating room. As Jeff said, the key for this is to develop a leadership body that's empowered to guide and sponsor change. The, uh, then you take that uh, level down and you start to form groups if necessary, depending upon the size of your organization, that actually look at the process of getting the patient in the app room. This includes pre-admission testing. Part of that pre-admission testing will be to minimize patient contact with the pre-admission testing centers. So though we're, I'm already talking to clients about more virtualized approach, uh, uh, telemedicine, and, and limiting as much as possible the patient's contact with the pre-admission testing center. We're talking about um, uh, uh, bringing in the finance and revenue cycle management right from the beginning. A key with this whole process, and this is actually good for surgery in general, is to get the patient into the system as early as possible. Many hospitals, and um, this is reality, many hospitals have, have a lot of variation and inconsistency in patient preparation. Um, from both uh, pre-anesthesia testing to, to uh, uh, financial uh, 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 pre-authorization to uh, a variety of these issues, there's a lot of differences in scheduling. A lot of that stuff is, is relatively last minute. We were at a hospital this morning where 35% of their elective, uh, the, their surgery in their operating room, and this is a tertiary care hospital, is scheduled within 24 hours of surgery. You cannot expect to create a COVID safe environment that your patients will uh, uh, work with if everything is last minute. And so you're gonna have to be much more careful in your, in your development of your pre-surgical patient preparation and scheduling process. Let's go to the next slide. The key, and Jeff mentioned this, the key to this is, is to start to, to really involve and develop a careful uh, uh, roadmap for the patient uh, as, he, as he or she moves through this pre-surgical process. Um, we, we are actually working with clients right now and we're, we're developing videos, we're de developing uh, roadmaps to successful surgery, all started within the surgeon's office and basically it, it carefully choreographs what the patient should expect, gives a two-way communication, Scheme with the patient and the surgeon and the hospital. Um, you, we develop in-depth patient education. This is really important. And then we develop uh, protocols. Uh, uh, I talked with a uh, ASC uh, in Georgia just a couple of days ago, and some of the ASCs I've been working with basically have told their patients that they don't want them. Uh, they they want them alone. They want them by themselves as they are dropped off and picked up, and they're actually 
asking patients not to bring along uh, 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 loved ones and, and uh, they're limiting those, those the company personnel to a minimum. That's by exception. I think hospitals have to be a little bit more uh, lean than that. But what we're seeing though, you have to develop a very uh, highly choreographed and consistent approach to getting the patient through the system. Uh, office variation in terms of, 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 especially for hospitals, it doesn't happen so much in ASC, but especially for hospitals, you have to engineer that out of the system, have a consistent approach that everybody agrees to, including the anesthesia department, the surgeons and their offices, scheduling, uh, and the financial people. Uh, and that will begin to, to, to uh, I think, allay some of the patient's fears about coming back into the hospital. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. So this is when a clinician basically states his, his uh, best plan for how to get a patient in and out of the hospital with the least amount of risk. And this is also uh, uh, is important for the caregivers. So you want to create a, a, a COVID safe environment. And we're going to go right down to this, this, this concept of testing. Uh, this morning I was working with a group, actually yesterday, and I was asked, why do we have to test patients in the hospital at ASC if we assume all the patients have COVID and we protect ourselves? Very good question. Uh, and my response was, and hopefully you agree with it, that there's going to be a certain percentage of patients uh, at, the, at the curbside when they're ready to go into the operating room, uh, ready to go into the facility, who will have pulse oximetry, temperature, and review systems that will all be negative but are COVID positive. And, uh, and it's anywhere from, it's estimated anywhere from five to 10% of those patients will be COVID positive. It, it depends on the area. And if, if a patient undergoes elective surgery and then comes down with COVID, the post-op course is obviously much more complicated. So the question is, when do you test and how do you test? Okay, I'll give you the, as of today, it may change by tomorrow, um, the best test in terms of sensitivity and specificity is the CDC recommended molecular test, which basically measures viral load and it, it measures uh, RNA replicase. Uh, it's 90 plus percent accurate. Um, and it's recommended that, unfortunately, the test requires at least one to two days turnaround. So it's recommended that patients, uh, some of the hospitals I'm working with have four days. The patient has to have the test four days prior to surgery. Other hospitals are saying three days prior to surgery to give it sufficient turnaround time. There's also a question of care, caregivers' uh, surveillance. Um, I don't, there is some consensus that caregivers should have at least weekly tests. Um, that obviously assures them that they're in a COVID-free environment, also assures the patient. Um, do you, is full PPE protection necessary? And at least as of today, uh, using the, uh, the joint statement, uh, we would suggest that yes, full PPE protection is, is necessary. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, the, uh, for, um, you know, for most surgical procedures, uh, it means that uh, an N95 mask, uh, gown, and, and eye protection and gloves are indicated. When you're dealing with more difficult situations where there's uh, atomized or aerosolized uh, contaminant, or in procedures that produce a lot of uh, 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 fragmentation, such as total knee surgery with uh, drilling and uh, uh, sawing, that you go one step further and you use a, uh, a hood, a surgical hood. If you, I think there's a lot of orthopedic surgeons on this, this call, and your hood, which is called a PAPR, which is a powered air purifying respirator, as you can see in this bottom photograph, generally should be worn, worn by all people in the room, not just the people it, 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 with, that are performing the surgery. So what you see here are two photographs. The first photograph um, uh, was actually taken, they're both taking an, an a freestanding surgeon on ASC. I'm administering a, a ductal canal block as part of a multimodal pain management technique. And what's uh, of importance, you could see the surgeon doing injections. This is a cocktail of uh, uh, Expiril, uh, Marcane, Toradol, Morphine, and Epinephrine. It's an 80 cc mixture with the 266 milligrams of, of uh, Expiril. And he's doing a careful, uh, small aliquot injection throughout the capsule. We're seeing, uh, and this is specifically for uh, orthopedic joints and hips, we're seeing 
two to three days of, of nearly no pain uh, and uh, a minimal use of, of opiates in the entire perioperative period. Um, so we, we're also recommending very strongly that whenever possible, you use these multimodal uh, pain techniques um, like Expiril uh, and blockage. You avoid the intubation whenever possible. Uh, and um, uh, and you do uh, and it, 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 state of the art uh, stuff. Uh, for example, this patient here received a, a GABA agonist, Tylenol, and a NACID prior to surgery, in addition to the adductor canal block and then the and then the uh, injection of uh, of Expiril Marcane uh, mixture. Uh, we've done hundreds of patients and sent them home within an hour or so after surgery. The same kind of concept can be used for a lot of different types of surgery and should be used for a lot. For example, the surgical home and, and, and it, uh, expedited recovery after surgery. Um, a couple of things. As far as that turnover, Jeff mentioned it quickly. If you intubate a patient, it is recommended by the joint statement and, and also ARN and, and many infectious disease people that the air exchange um, must occur to 99% of, of, of what occurred at the time of intubation. That it could take anywhere from 12 minutes to over 30 minutes, depending upon your facility and your HVAC system. So let's say you intubate a patient. The only people in the room should be the, anesth the anesthesiologist or anesthetist, uh, maybe a, a, a nurse circulator that are properly protected. You have to wait at least 12 to minutes to 30 minutes before bringing in the surgeon and the surgical team. That's recommended. As far as extubation goes, the same process. At least 12 to minutes, 12 to 30 minutes of time spent before the cleaning crew can come in to clean the room. So you're going to have, especially in complicated cases, longer sur surgical time as well as longer turnover time. That should be expected. Uh, what else? Have I got everything else? So pretty much. Pretty much everything on this slide. I also would like to suggest that you start with simple procedures first, both from either in the ASC or the hospital. Start with something that's simple. The patient's discharged that day, and you can develop your system and 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 uh, work out the kinks uh, and uh, uh, tweak it as appropriate. So next slide, please. Okay. So we talked about preoperative preparation. We talked about the day of surgery. Let's talk about how do you prioritize, and then to build a schedule uh, based on your backlog. As Jeff said, you're going to have certain patients that will not want to come back for a variety of reasons to the, the hospital or ASC operating room. But a couple of key points. First, I would recommend for all those on, on the, on the uh, conference call right now that you develop as much as possible, working with the surgeon's office, a fairly complete list of backlog patients. Uh, again, this morning, uh, working with uh, a, a hospital, basically said that some of the surgeon's office did not want, have, have not uh, provided a list. And they, there was a variety of reasons for this, but it's really important if you really want to manage this backlog to have a fairly complete list of, of potential volume that needs to be addressed. The second thing is uh, you need to have historical, and you, all of you have this, historical uh, uh, times for different procedures for different specialists. Uh, and different specialties. Uh, with the, uh, the backlog cases and the historic times, uh, and then a, a prior to prioritization system, um, you can begin to, to, to anticipate what's needed, when it's needed, how much volume, how, how, much, how many minutes of surgery are needed. Um, you can see a system here where you, you get the projected volume, and then you prioritize cases based on a variety of different factors patient acuity, case margin, uh, backlog volume. Um, and there's a whole bunch of, of different factors, but you as an individual institution should, should define your priorities. The other thing I want to I caution you on is you all have a traditional system of, of surgeon access, which is basically block time system. Uh, and, and, but I would suggest to you, as you approach this uh, uh, restarting of elective surgery, that you may have to modify significantly the historic uh, block time system. For example, a surgeon may have, let's say, uh, 16 hours of block or access a week. That surgeon may not have a significant backlog of patients. On the other hand, other surgeons and other specialties 
that didn't have much block to begin with may have a lot of cases to put on. And so you're going to have to, uh, part of the, the, uh, the steering committee's activity will be not only, not only to prior, prioritize cases, but also to, to uh, fairly uh, resume this uh, surgery and, and, and this backlog. Um, and, and you may have to have a much different, at least for a temporary period of time, a much different system of access. Uh, next slide. This is the last slide. Uh, and I'm just summarizing what, what, what Jeff and, and uh, Leslie has, have already said. You want to establish a governance council. This is really important to get the whole process uh, um, started. And this governance council must be uh, given the authority uh, to guide and, and, uh, uh, and to sponsor change. Apply for grants as soon as possible. And then obviously, you, get, you should start immediately. Most of the hospitals are starting <clears throat> restarting surgery within the next few weeks. And the earlier you start this planning process, the, uh, the, the smoother the process will be. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you so much for your presentation. As a reminder to all attendees, Please feel free to submit your questions using the questions panel within the GoToWebinar control panel. And we will now shift to the Q&A session of today's webinar. All right, the first question. Sports cases are fast. What's the spacing required in the recovery room? Recommendations or guidelines? Yes. Um... Yes, as somebody who's uh, been the medical director for Illinois Bone and Joint uh, with uh, 110 Men Orthopedic Group in Chicago, I can I can attest that they are fast, and they're going to have at least uh, so your your PACU, which is what you're talking about, your recovery room, should have. There's a couple of things that are, are recommended. Number one, you should have minimal uh, contact with with only one uh, post-op person for the patient recovering. In other words, having multiple changes of, of bedside contact probably should be minimized. The second thing is you want to have, and, um, and you can look at an ARN for all these recommendations, but you want to have at least six feet between patients. So in smaller facilities, this may be problematic. And it may affect your capacity. Thank you. The next question. What if everyone in the room wears an N95 throughout the procedure? Do you still need to wait the 12 to 21 minutes to enter the OR? Um, no. Um, and I, I may have not presented it well, but for the, the, the delay in entering the OR should only occur with intubation um, and extubation. Now, the question remains, if you put an LMA in, uh, is that the same thing? I don't know yet. There's still this is still an evolving uh, consensus. But if you're if you're using a a, a local a regional anesthetic, spinal epidural, whatever it may be, and the patient's just sedated, you come in right away, um, and uh, there shouldn't be any delay. And same same for the the cleaning of the room afterwards. Excellent. Thank you. The next question is, what should providers do today to make sure they get payment under the CARES Act? So um, I, I think um, we talked about it earlier. What is, extremely, what is extremely important is that you follow what is going on because every couple of days, there's a different fund of money that is um, available. And what you want to make sure of is that any fund you qualify for, you're applying. As we said earlier, there is $50 billion that has now been allocated. And all you really have to do is have a Medicare provider number and you qualify and just either file your um, cost Medicare cost report. If you're a hospital or an ASC or a physician practice, if you file your tax return, the decrease in patients that you've you've seen in your um, TIN number, your your tax return number, you will get payment. And we'd encourage everybody to apply because there's no downside risk and you don't have to pay it back. Thank you. 
Fantastic. Thank you for that information. The next question. For a standard total knee replacement procedure, what is the estimated added time for COVID precautions? 50% was stated. Is that approximately an additional hour? Um, a good question. It, so first of all, you would assume because you're doing drilling and, 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 and a lot of uh, manipulation, there's a lot of particulate matter in the air. Um, there's no problem with uh, the, usually these patients are not intubated. Um, many of them are done under spinal. So well, how do you handle a patient who has, has this kind of, uh, it's a different from an intubation issue. First of all, assume that this particulate matter is contaminated. And what the nurses are recommending uh, and what uh, physicians are recommending are the following. Um, after the case, though, it's a normal induction. It, you're, you're no delay if you're doing a, a regional type approach for these total knees. There's no delay. You can start right away. But um, at the end of the case, all the instruments are placed within the cabinet. And all the instrument trays are placed within the cabinet. And the cabinet's wiped down and it leaves the room immediately. The patient leaves the room, and then you add whatever to, to get the 90, you know, the 99 percent air exchange. You add about uh, depends on your facility anywhere from 12 to 30 minutes of additional time after the patient uh, leaves the the room uh, uh, for the 99 percent turnover. So it's about a half an hour um, using this scheme, about a half an hour extra between total joints, and that's turnover time, not not case time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, what will be the impact of COVID on the manner in which we deliver and organize perioperative care? Well, um, that's a great question. Um, I, I've talked to people in the last week or two that basically said, from now on, anesthesia providers will always wear N95 masks forever. I, I'm not sure if that's going to happen, but you specifically ask what has to change with 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 COVID and the and and uh, uh, and managing this backlog of patients. Well, as we said before, and I'll, I'll stress it again: you have to develop a consistent system of patient preparation that includes workup, lab testing, financial issues, scheduling process, patient education. It's got to be highly choreographed, and you have to engineer out. I'll just give you an example. Tomorrow morning, I'm actually presenting to a group of surgeons in a major hospital um, the, the following concept. You get your patients into the operating room, prepared for surgery, both from a clinical and financial uh, perspective. Uh, you want to have your patients ready for surgery, completely ready for surgery within 72 hours, uh, greater than 72 hours prior. Uh, this is for elective cases prior to the date of surgery. So, Again, highly choreographed, consistent throughout the entire uh, surgeon, surgical community. And then uh, whenever possible, get your patients into the system prepared, educated as early as possible. So I think to sort of um, add to that, there, there's going to be a lot more time and a lot more attention spent on making sure you understand what's going on with that patient medically. 72 yeah, hours before surgery. You need to make sure that they have access to the tests and you need to prepare them that in many organizations, they can't have a loved one or family member with them because we want to minimize the number of people that are in the healthcare environment. So it's gonna be a little scarier. We're gonna have to have staff that actually go out to a patient's car to bring them in. We're gonna to have to um, have one provider that takes care of that patient through the pre-op and post-operative recovery, and then we have to take them out to the car. So it's not only gonna take more time, it's gonna take more staff, and it's gonna be more expensive to provide surgical care in this country now than it was before. And that is going to be a problem because if you add 20, 30 minutes to a case, that's very expensive. It's also expensive because surgeons can't do as many cases in an eight hour block in this 
new environment as they did before. So it's frustrating because surgeons are trying to make up for lost revenue over the past six months, and they want to get more cases done, but they're not going to be able. There's going to be incredible pressure for more flip rooms so that we um, don't have to wait as long when a patient is in the room so there isn't the normal turnover time. So it's really going to be a series of discussions that is going to focus on how we totally change the manner in which we relate to our patients, we follow our patients, and how we interact with our surgeons. Thank you. And I'll, I'll add to that as well. And, and this is Leslie Basham. I apologize for the, the sound issues before. And Jeff, thank you for, for taking over. But um, I think another trend that, that builds on what Jeff was saying with, with this additional patient anxiety, I think it's they're going to have greater decision-making power and they'll have a little bit more uh, uh, driving some of, of the decisions as well as thinking about where is the right place to do that case. And, and as we talked about before, there will be this accelerated shift to ASCs. There will be a greater interest, I think, in the patient and the family to do the surgery or the procedure in the ASC. So I think when we think about the future of perioperative management, we need to be thinking about uh, also where it is done um, and, and figuring out ways to, to get that patient out of the, in, to reduce the length of stay post-procedure. And, um, and that, that also couples with the shift to the ASC. Thank you. Thank you. And our final question before we wrap up today's webinar, what guidelines do you suggest for industry inventory and instruments delivered to the OR? What guidelines do you have regarding industry representatives in the room? Well, it, it's going to be, it's going to vary. It's a great question. Um, and, and there's no, there's no strong consensus right now. Um, many procedures uh, and many uh, surgical specialists require uh, a, uh, a specialist uh, that represents the, uh, the implant or whatever uh, in the room. Um, part of the preoperative preparation process, and it was mentioned in the slide, I didn't mention it, and I apologize for that, is if you bring in your cell processing and materials man management unit as part of your planning for getting the patient into the opera room and out of the opera room right from the beginning. Uh, it includes um, developing a scheduling process that uh, basically alerts, um, it, it basically alerts both the sterile processing uh, and uh, the hospital that a, a, a representative of a particular manufacturer may be in that opera room. And then it's also going to take education and careful management of that uh, that person within the opera room to make sure that he respects uh, the COVID-free environment that we're we're trying to build. So it, it it's going to add complexity. There's no easy answer, but it starts right at the beginning, right at the scheduling time, right at the, right at the time of scheduling. Excellent. Thank you so much to our speakers, Jeff, Leslie, and Tom. We greatly appreciate your time. And thank you to our attendees for joining us today. That concludes today's webinar. Thank you very much. Have a good one.